your life today is vastly different from when you were drinking almost 10 years ago, Brad, tell us a little bit about how that, about that difference. Um, well, my life today is pretty good. Honestly. Uh, it's actually really good. I mean, I find a lot of things to complain about, but I'm going to be honest. I really (laughs) don't have, uh, you know, the problems I have today are pretty, uh, pretty minuscule compared to, compared to, to what I used to experience, you know, I've got a couple different businesses that, uh, that do well. And, um, I'm, I'm fortunate and blessed for that. Uh, they do well, despite me sometimes I stay, but, uh, but you know, I'm a, I'm a father. Uh, my son, Dominic will be turning two in June and, um, and, and that's a pretty cool deal, you know, and, and it wasn't like that for me. I, uh, you know, 10 years ago, I, I was, you know, I, I was chatting with you before, uh, the podcast and I just said, you know, the warning signs that I should stop drinking were about five years before I finally quit. And so I, I wish I would have, it was very evident that drinking was taking a toll on my life. And I just kind of ignored those warning signs and ultimately, you know, kind of ended up on the extreme end. But again, like it was well before I finally quit that I saw there was a problem. So, yeah. Why do you think people take, so long i mean why did it take you five years before you actually did something you know um you know i liked the escape right i liked the feeling produced by alcohol and uh i liked you know it it became my coping mechanism when when things were great we would celebrate with a drink when things were bad um i would add drink to cope you know and uh and i just thought it was really normal um and I didn't know any other way. Cause you know, I started drinking at like 13 mm. and kind of experimented, you know, at an early age, obviously I wasn't heavily drinking and then through high school, it was kind of, you know, that's what we did. And then I went to college and, um, ended up dropping out of college. Um, mostly because I saw that I didn't really want to go to college. I thought, well, I'll just be an entrepreneur, but, um, and I also dropped out because I couldn't get enough grades that I was going to be basically kicked out and, and that was all due to partying, you know, but I, I just thought that was so normal. I just, and, and I think what the story I told myself was, ah, you'll grow out of this phase, you'll grow up and you'll stop, but that's not what happened. Yeah. Where did you grow up? Which, which part of the U S um, I grew up in, in Utah in Salt Lake city, Utah, where I'm currently at. So, and was there a big drinking culture growing up in, no. in that no, you know, it's very, um, the state is still heavily far less than it was maybe 20, 30 years ago, but still a very, um, Mormon culture. So, uh, very Christian kind of almost like Bible beltish, uh, the, the Mormon church, uh, while good people, uh, you know, were definitely not people who drank and it was, you know, kind of taboo even to like, talk about like my parents didn't drink. I wasn't around alcohol in the home. And so, when I was sneaking around drinking as a high school kid, like I kind of, you know, pulled the wool over their eyes, so to speak. They had no idea. You know, I'd say I'm going to spend the weekend with my friends and then we, we would get drunk and uh, and they had no clue I was drinking. And so there wasn't this big culture. And, and even today, I mean, alcohol, you can't even buy hard liquor in the grocery store here. You have to go to the state liquor store. That's the only place you can get it. Um, so the drinking culture here, I mean, there's not these great bars I just really enjoyed the, for the effect produced and uh, to the point where I obviously enjoyed that more than how absolutely destructive I would feel the next day. Right. Mm. So you didn't have a culture around you or friends or family members encouraging you to drink. It was your own choice, your own decision. And this, the culture of the state being very Mormon in Utah is almost the opposite of that. So you didn't have that kind of, come on, this is what you do. This was like a, a personal choice of yours. Yeah. And almost kind of like a rebellious thing. You know, I struggled with anxiety from a young age and I didn't know how to articulate that as a 12 or 13 year old kid at the time. And this is like 1995. And, you know, I feel like anxiety is now more openly talked about, like even with kids, my sister has her kids same age as I was at that time. And they're in therapy about his anxiety. And it wasn't just talked about and normalized. And so when I, when I did drink, I remember the first time I drank and I drank Jack Daniels whiskey and I drank it. And I remember thinking, why would anyone do this? The taste was awful. It burned. And then shortly after I said, Oh, I know why they do it. It's this release. And so 
I, I think I began drinking with like this escape, you know, and, and again, that was at a young age, but it kind of continued. And, um, and it continued to the point where before I knew it, you know, I definitely had this addiction, maybe not as much physically at the time, like not the shakes, but I couldn't picture my life without drinking, you know, despite the consequences, because the, the drinking got more heavy. And so I would feel worse and worse. Um, and I thought I, you know, I'd say, well, I'm not an alcoholic because I'm not waking up drinking. I'm just going to have a hangover, feel like shit, waste my whole next day and then party again that night. And so mm. the stories I told myself was like, oh, you don't really have a problem. People have a problem or waking up drinking first thing in the morning, mm. um, you know, and not not examining just the amount of Sundays I wasted doing nothing but laying there because I felt so awful from Friday and Saturday night. Are, are too many to count, you know? Hmm. So when did you, you said it was five years from when you kind of thought maybe you should stop to five to five years later that when you actually did stop, how old were you during that phase and what was going on in your thought process around that time? So I, I got sober at, uh, you know, I got sober at 28 years old. Um, yeah. Cause so you're 37, 38 now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, okay. um, and so I got sober about 28 and it, it, again, it, you know, 23, I had already managed to drop out of college. Right. I, hmm. um, would bounce around from fitness job to fitness job, always talking about, Hey, one day I'm going to start my own thing and I'm going to be an entrepreneur. You watch. And, but I, I just, the partying took such a toll. And, and honestly, I'm grateful I didn't have to go through, you know, entrepreneurship with that. I see some of my buddies where I'm like, you're wasting so much productivity just being, you get drunk and then you waste the whole next day. And so at about 23, I mean, by that point, I'd already dropped out of college. I was kind of bouncing around from fitness job to fitness job. And I realized that I wasn't my friends would be like, oh, I'm not going to drink this weekend. I've got, I've got this and this I've got to prepare for. And I would think, well, who cares? Get drunk and then do that. It doesn't matter. And so at that time I started realizing that, you know, even when I told myself I wouldn't drink that weekend, I ended up drinking mm. and I saw, and then I started dabbling in some, some narcotics too, some, some drugs and just thought, ah, oh, this is pretty normal. And then I started to use those even when I would tell myself I wouldn't. And so from that year, from about 25 to 28 is when, you know, the drinking led me to more recreational drugs, which led me to far more issues than I could have imagined. Mm. And what were some of those issues? Well, you know, I mean, for starters, I, um, you know, I ended up, uh, and again, it was always like, it wasn't like I would just, I think, some people underestimate how much alcohol will lower your inhibitions, right? It wasn't like I was, I would always say like, oh, I'll never do that or I'll never do that. And um, I had heard about how addictive opiate painkillers were. And so I was like, hey, I don't want to go down that road. And then when I was drunk one night, someone said, oh, this will make you, you'll make you feel better. So I tried them and then I loved them. And then before I knew it, you know, I, I kind of got a dependence on those and I realized that all my bad decisions I made, but not all of them, a lot of them in my life were when I was under the influence of alcohol, mm. you know? And again, in my right mind, I don't think I would have been like, Hey, give me a, uh, let's do those pain pills that are really addictive. And I've seen mm -hmm. people have really hard struggles on them, but mm. when I was drunk, it sounded like a good idea. And then I liked them. And so the next day I got a little more. And so the issues just kind of started to snowball and, and, you know, ruined relationships. Um, again, right. this, this pipe dream of starting my own thing as an entrepreneur would always just about to happen. And then it would get derailed. And then I would start to like create something and I could never go from A to Z and put it into action. Until what point where you drew a line in the sand? Um, you know, like I was saying to you, and, and that's why I admire like your, I, I actually admire people's stories more who just took a step back and said, alcohol is not serving my life. I don't want to do this anymore. 
I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not going to be healthy. There's nothing healthy about it. There's like, I admire that more than almost people like me who got kind of, because of the, the separate kind of um, pain pill narcotic addiction got, play, got kind of forced in this position of, well, I've got to go to, I've got to go detox off this stuff and get sober. Um, or I might end up dead. Like I've seen a lot of people overdose and like, it was like, you know, these were normal guys that like, weren't like drug addicts under the bridge. And so I thought, so I finally kind of forced, forced in this position where I realized I had this dependence and, um, and I couldn't stop doing them. And I was physically addicted, meaning if I didn't have them, I would, I would be pretty sick. And so I went to detox and, and, um, and got sober. But you know, what was interesting was after about two months, I saw a lot of people who had gotten sober off, you know, pain pills who were still drinking. And I, and I would, and I was tempted for a minute. I thought, you know, maybe if I just went back to the booze, but didn't touch any of the drugs and something kind of, you know, I almost did one night and it's like, I finally played the tape all the way forward. And I realized every bet, every really, really bad decision I've made has usually involved alcohol in some way or shape or form. You know, I had had a DUI. I forgot to say that was other kind of turning point was got a DUI, went to jail, like got in trouble with the law and something just clicked inside of me that was like, you know, even if you could just have one drink, is it worth it? Is it worth like feeling like crap, possibly risky making a really poor decisions is it worth it? And I remember just telling myself, like, I don't think it is, but I told myself, well, but you can drink eventually, just not right now. And 10 years later, I still haven't drank because I realized how good I feel not drinking, you know? Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. I don't really know much about what doing a detox or going to rehab entails other than uh, you know, what I've read and people have told me anecdotally, because I, I did, that wasn't my story. My story was, I woke up one morning, looked in the mirror and thought, I'm going to take a 30 day break because I feel kind of crap and I'll see what happens. And it was like a 30 day experiment that ended up now it's 12 years. Oh, amazing. And still, and still going. But, you know, I mean, I, I, I knew, I mean, I was feeling tired and lethargic and I put on weight and I didn't look good and I wasn't sleeping great. And my life was just blah. It wasn't rock bottom. It was just a six out of 10. Just everything felt like a six, six and a half, maybe yeah. just kind of like average, mediocre, tired, lethargic, whatever. And that was enough pain for me, that mediocrity to make, to make a change. But for you, it sounds like it was, you know, for you, it was, it sounds like it was something more st- more maybe more serious because there was there was opioids and there was alcohol and there was drugs and you need to actually do a detox so what mm-hmm. is what what is a detox and what is the the detox or the rehab that you did yeah i mean it was like a medical supervision because you know while it, you know it's interesting i learned in there that even though you feel like you're going to die when you're detoxing off opiates, it's actually only benzodiazepines like Xanax and then alcohol are the two that you actually legitimately can die from. Um, and, but I, you know, they medically detox me. And so they basically just kind of kept me somewhat comfortable, but not with any, um, I'm trying to remember what they used, but you know, I, I basically laid in kind of a hospital bed for four or five days and um, they kept, IV fluids going and vitamins and, um, you know, things for like, you know, the nausea or because you kind of, you get sick to your stomach and throw up. And so it was under medical supervision. And, um, and, you know, I guess part of the story was I did that and that was the first time. And then the second time, because I ended up relapsing shortly after the second time, um, I actually did it on my own and because I, uh, I had ran up, uh, my parents wouldn't send me, I was not on their insurance anymore. And so I did it on my own and that was brutal. That was, uh, that was not very fun. And that was when I, that was when I spent some time a few days in jail after the DUI. And that's when it finally clicked that like, I don't want to live like this. And, you know, I look back and I was, I was, 23 years old when I realized everything was kind of a five or six in my life, like you spoke of, 
but I thought I would just kind of grow out of it. So I, I wonder if I was more like 30 at that point, if I would have had enough kind of wherewithal to say, Hey, I got to stop this, you know, but, but I was young and I was like, yeah, like, it'll be fine. I'll get better at this or I'll stop drinking. And that quickly, that six in my life went to a two pretty quick in the next five years. But, um, you know, and in the first part of my journey, I did like AA and, and 12 steps and, um, and that was good. And I have mixed feelings. I'm just going to be honest about kind of that. Like, I think mean, there's a lot of good that comes from it. And there's also a lot of um, dogma that I didn't always agree with. And, um, but such as anything, you know, organized, you could kind of find good and pros, pros and cons for everything. But um, I genuinely thought, okay, I can't do drugs anymore. I had to detox twice. It was bad. I threw up. I vomited. Like the second time was much more brutal. I was very sick. But again, I, I kind of thought, well, I'll go back to drinking eventually. Just no more drugs. That was awful. I don't want to do that. And, and kind of like you, I just kept saying, well, I feel pretty good. Why don't I give it another 30 days? And then I'll kind of decide. And then that went and I said, wow, like I'm getting healthier. My blood work's getting better. I'm getting in better shape. Um, my cognitive functions better. Um, my sleep was improving. And so I was just like, oh, okay, I'll give it another kind of couple months and then I'll reevaluate. And then I got to the point, I think after a year, I kind of was like, I don't think I want to do this. So I'm not going to keep checking in with myself if I want to drink, you know? And you just kept going and it's been almost a decade, almost 10 years. Now, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, I've definitely been, been you know my instagram tag is the sober bodybuilder and i made that name up when i was uh competing in bodybuilding and so i thought well i'm sober and i'm a bodybuilder and i'm not a bodybuilder anymore so but uh, i don't compete actively in bodybuilding but i am uh yeah i've been very honest about my struggles and um and i just kind of feel like it's it's important for people to know that there's there's a life on the other side of this whether you've been hardcore addicted or whether you just felt like alcohol or recreational drugs wasn't serving you anymore, that there's a beautiful life on the other side. And that, man, I, I've, I've heard you talk about this. I have a lot of fun in my life. Like I still go to things. I have fun. I enjoy it. I probably go home a little earlier than most people, but you can still have, and in fact, it's more fun because I remember all this shit, right? I remember having fun the next morning instead of like, what did we do? I was like, oh yeah. I kind of piece it together and be like, oh yeah. Okay. Um, I enjoy life today sober and, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. And I think a lot of people, even if they're not alcoholics, maybe they just drink and it's just become part of their habitual kind of routine in their life. Don't understand that there's, there's a beautiful other side to this, you know? Mm. How did you see your life transform and like in year one, year two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, now you're at almost 10 years. So was there, was it like compound interest that things just got better and better or did it get really, really good in the first year, then it dropped and you struggled and then you wanted to go back to it and then it went up again, or has it been a consistent, consistently up? Like, yeah, it's a good question. You know, the first couple months, I'm going to be honest, kind of, kind of sucked because I, I kept thinking about wanting to use them. And after a couple months, it started to get much better. And then I would say, you know, for the most part, it's gradually gone up. It really has. There's been some, some lulls. Um, you know, even it's funny. Uh, I don't, I don't think about it often. In fact, I would say I haven't had a craving for drugs and alcohol in quite a while. Um, but there's only been a couple instances in the last probably eight years that I have. And one of those was I went through a divorce, uh, about a year and a half ago. And, it was funny. All of a sudden I was by myself one night and, you know, that was kind of a low point in my life going through those things and feeling it. And it came to me, like, you should just go grab a bottle of liquor. Like you'll just pass out. You won't think about all this and you'll, you'll feel better. And I kind of tried to dismiss it and it kept coming back. And um, luckily I did some counterintuitive. I don't know if I went for a walk that night or I went and did something. I read a book and, and I went to bed and I woke up the next morning and, and I was like, wow, I'm really glad I didn't do that because I have zero desire to do it today. But my life has 
I would say it's compounded interest. It's gotten better and better. And of course, there's life situations we go through, but um, my health has continued to get better and better. Um, I feel better and better. I, I it is it has definitely been one of the bigger blessings in my life. And and outside of that moment in the last 10, eight years, I don't ever like I go out with people and they drink at the dinner table and they say, Do you drink? And I said, They want to drink. I said, No, I don't drink. And it's crazy how most people just go, oh, that's awesome. Good for you. Very few people are like, no, you, you have to have a drink. When you adamantly tell them, I don't drink, a lot of people just respect that. And, and I can have a good time with people drinking without people drinking because it's no longer this temptation in my life. Mm. Do, you, uh, do you notice a ch change in society or with people's attitudes towards alcohol or are we still stuck in the same cultural attitude that we've been in for decades i i think there's i think there's been a slight shift i i even feel that maybe in the last five years as people have realized more and more that you know I mean, for you look at, you know, rates of even alcoholism and drug addiction have continued to rise and people have just seen the impact on that, whether it's them personally or their family or friends or, and also I think that people are realizing as there's been more and more awareness around health, I feel like in the last five years, um, and maybe I'm biased on that, but the people are realizing that, you know, they talk about a donut being empty calories and I'll say, I'll challenge you. Alcohol is the definition of empty calories because it's not a protein. It's not a carb. It's not a fat and it has to go through your liver. And I think the more and more, I, I feel like it's getting better. People are realizing like, oh, we don't have to bring alcohol to the party to have fun. Um, I think it's slightly better. I still think we're stuck in this rut where, you know, I think that becomes the central point of like, Hey, we're going to have this liquor or this wine at this party or dinner party. Like, and like, that's still kind of the vocal point, but I feel like it's getting better as a whole. I don't know how you feel about it. Um, well, I'll tell you this, as we're recording this, I'm in Australia right now and zero alcohol beers have exploded in popularity. There's still very, very small percentage of the overall beer consumption market, but it's just, in terms of people do, using it, it's exploded, it's increased. So there seems to be an increase in awareness of the damaging effects, effects of alcohol and an increase in people's willingness to try alcohol-free alternatives. And I am noticing that certainly in, in Australia, which is a very, very big Australian culture. Um, you know, I started a TikTok account uh, a couple months ago and uh, I put some videos up there and one of my videos got a million views. I think it's up to 1.1 million views right Whoa. now. And um, the, the, the video started, starts off with me saying alcohol is shit. <laughs> and then it goes into why. And I'd love to say that um, 100% of the, let's see how many comments I've got on there now. I think it's like, I'm not sure how many comments. Let me just open up my TikTok and I'll have a look. On the 1.1 million, I've got 6,039 comments. I'd oh love my to say, gosh. I'd love to say that 100% that of the 6,039 comments that I currently have are all positive, but they're not. I would say 75% of them are people saying, you're an idiot. Um, alcohol obviously calls, causes hair loss because <laughs> I'm bored. It's actually quite funny, some of the people. that <laughs> It's actually kind of funny, some of the stuff that they say. Um, you're an idiot. Yeah, but drinking's fun. You know, like inane stuff a lot of times. Um, but you know, I mean, I 25% of them, which is still a good 1500 people, 1500 comments, I should say, 1500 comments are all really positive going, yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's and so that is very heartening to me. The 1500 people are now are saying, I agree with you that you don't need it to have a good time and that you can live an alcohol-free life and, and have, a, have a wonderful life. I mean, that, that's something. And TikTok is always, even more than Instagram. We'll have the uh, keyboard warriors. I, 
some of my posts on there, which I need to be more active on. I'm like, man, they come out brutal on TikTok. <laughs> They're just attacking me in every every way, shape, or form. But it also probably triggered something in them because they know you're not wrong. Like, yeah, sure, it's fun, but they know that the I'm sure the reasons you listed are, aren't just just strictly opinion based. It's a lot of actual factual evidence as well as anecdotal evidence, right? Like, mm. I mean, it's not good for you. I, and we got to quit like coining this that like somehow drinking red wine is healthy because, you know, and again, if somebody wants to drink in moderation here and there, like I have no judgment of that. I have a lot of friends who drink and some of them I think drink too much. That's not my, my place to say. And some of them drink very casually, like once a month. And I guess my challenge would be to the, like, even my buddy who drinks just like every so often and he goes, ah, but I always get a headache and feel like shit after. And I said, well, if you only do it like once every two months, why not just cut it out completely? And his face was like, well, I, like they don't want to go there. They're like, maybe this might not be the greatest thing for him, even if it's only here and there, mm. but I have no judgment if people drink. But if it's causing even remotely any issues that you're living at a six out of 10 instead of a nine out of 10, why not try 30 days? And if you can't, then maybe that's something deeper to explore. That If you can't take a 30 day break and see how you feel, there might be something more to that, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because people are always asking me in emails, how much does your program cost? They say, oh, you know, I see you, you help people stop drinking for 30 days or 90 days. What does it cost? And, you know, I mean, I want to respond and I want to tell them, but, but the question that always comes up into my head when they ask me that question is, well, how much is it costing you not to stop drinking? Mm. Right. People are like, oh, what does it cost to do your program and stop drinking? And I'm thinking, what does it cost you not to? And for yeah. some people, it costs them a divorce which can be hundreds of thousands of dollars. It can cost them their health, which can be increased medical bills or death. It can mean being uh, disconnected to your children or your family. Um, you, might be, um, you might be a pretty satisfactory or okay worker in your job, in your company and get paid a pretty good salary, but maybe it's costing you a promotion that you would have got if you had clarity and focus and you were operating at an eight or a nine out of 10. And that promotion could have generated you in another, you know, could have been a $30,000 a year raise with, with more benefits or, you know what I mean? So it's like people, you know, and I do this myself as well. So I get, it. I don't want to just be so disparaging people, but because I'm always, you know, wanting to know what the price is and I'm doing a cost analysis, but I just wish I could implore people to just think about what is not stopping alcohol costing you what is it yeah. not costing you and then you would then you then it's like who cares how much it costs to get coached on this to stop because it's like the return on investment is like 10x 20x 50x and not even to mention you went even a deeper level my first thought when you said this is how much it costs to go spend a bunch of money on drinks at the bar. Like, mm. and even like, what does it cost you not when, as I talked about, you know, your inhibitions get a little looser. I've, I've seen people cost them their integrity by, by doing things on one night stands that they would not normally do. The mm. list goes on. Like, you know, we could, we could add to this in, in, in forever. Right. You're mm. absolutely right. Like, what is it not costing you? to do this and mm -hmm. it's only in retrospect probably when you get away from it that you can zoom out and go holy shit it was costing me so much more than i even had a clue right mm -hmm. so. yeah hey uh just for just for fun may i read out some of these comments from this tiktok video i would and we love can, to hear it. and yeah. we can dissect them yeah I'll just uh i'll just read them really quickly um makes me happy and dance real good it's my life i love it alcohol is fine till you become addicted to it I met my wife in a pub, so therefore alcohol is great. That's your opinion. Um, uh, it gives you fun. Everyone likes fun. Oh, I bet you're great fun. Jeez, have a beer, will you? Um, I'm craving alcohol now. Bore off. Uh, cheers to this. I think we all sleep good on alcohol. Um, Okie dokie, I'll have a wee toke instead. 
what about hair growth? <laughs> See, they start, they're always smashing me about being bored. It's so funny. They're like, it obviously makes your hair fall out though, <laughs> being alcohol free. <laughs> um, even Jesus drinked wine and God approved. I bet he's fun at parties. Uh, a glass of red wine has been medically proven to be good. See, I just I just watched Eurovision on nine pints in. <laughs> oh I mean, man, what do you think? You know, and and when you read comments like that, I'm like, maybe we have got we haven't got anywhere in society, but I'm sure that you know, like you said, there's a lot of good ones too. But you know, it's interesting. Somebody said in there, we all sleep good on alcohol, and if they were actually talking about sleeping, that's actually factually incorrect. Actually, you and, and my my clients that have an aura ring device will see how incredibly high heart rate they don't fall asleep, they pass out, which is very different. Right. Their heart rate variability tanks, their heart rate is super high. They don't get into deep sleep. So right. passing out and falling asleep in your natural circadian rhythm are two very different things. And actually, that's one reason why you feel like such shit when you wake up is you don't sleep well. You passed out, but you're not actually in deep and REM sleep in the rejuvenative, uh, rejuvenating sleep. Uh, and, and it's funny, again, the illusion that if you're sober, you can't be fun. I like to think I'm one of the more fun guys at the party. Yeah. You know? And, and I feel empathy for those people that I think they genuinely believe that they cannot be fun at a party unless they are drinking. Mm. And, and like, that makes me sad for them. Like I have true empathy because I've been there where I didn't think I was going to be cool at the party or nobody's going to like me, or I wasn't going to be fun if I wasn't drunk. And the reality is I made more of an ass out of myself more often than I didn't, especially towards the end. And so I feel for those people because there's a beautiful life on the other side and you obviously triggered something in them. Um, cause some of the people got really defensive there and just because you met your wife at a bar. Well, great. That's, that's awesome. That doesn't mean you have to keep drinking. It's like, you already met her. You're good. It served its mm. purpose. Mm. Well, those are great know, comments. 50 something percent of marriages seem to end in divorce anyway. So there's yep. no guarantee that meeting, me, meeting your wife or your husband in a bar is actually good, good news for you long term, given the, given the statistics. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, yeah, so um, I'm wondering, you said you mentioned you have a two-year-old son, Dominic, yeah? Yeah. Do you feel uh, if you had been, if you were drinking as opposed to this part of your life where you're not drinking, that your connection with him might be different? Like, how do you think you might be different with him, your way of being, if you were the earlier version of Brad as opposed to the current version? Oh, um, I, you know, it's a great question. And I've thought about it before. And I definitely have a very firm belief that I'm a far more present father. I'm a far more patient father. Um, I remember every single moment with him. And whether he chooses to drink or not, I get to set an example that you can live a great life and that you don't have to drink. And what, you know, again, he'll have his own agency. He can do, he's going to choose whatever he's going to choose. But at least he has an example of like, well, my dad doesn't drink and he sure, sure as hell seems happy. And to me, that's one of the greatest gifts is that I get to show him this way. And again, he'll pave his own path. But I know that I can lead by example and show him that it is not only just possible to have a great life, but like you can thrive in it. And in fact, I would argue more sober in all the different areas we just touched on. And, and that, you know, he doesn't have to go down any bad path. Like he, he, I know I'm a better father today because I'm sober. There's no doubt about that. You know, I think about waking up on a Sunday morning hungover and how I would pro uh, fiend for yourself. All right. Instead we're up, we're outside, we're going to the park. We're having a blast. He's coming to get coffee with me. He's not drinking coffee. No worries. And like all of that would not happen if I was hungover. I know myself, I, I have too much data to look back on to go, yeah, I probably would have been a slug the first half of the day. Let him kind of do his own thing, laying on the couch, grabbing some water, laying back down. 
and then finally mustering up some energy to play with him. And that's not the kind of dad I want to be. And again, I'm not saying that everyone's like that who drinks just more often than not, I was hung over. And I even, I'm even thinking about that more than, you know, because I like to think that maybe I'd be the dad who waited to drink till I put him down, but it's the after effects of the next day, but who knows, maybe I would still have been drinking when I was with him. And again, I'm not, you know, a beer is fine, but then it's two, then it's three, then it's four. And then you're a little tipsy and then you're forgetting to put them down at the right time. And it's this whole cascade of events. So I am, I'm convinced to the deepest part of my soul that I'm a better father today because I'm sober. And that's mm. not a knock on anyone who drinks. I just know how I showed up even the day after. And, and I know that I show up as a more present father. Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing that, Brad. Yeah. Well, mate, um, thanks for sharing some time with me and for sharing your story and being so candid about it and opening up. Uh, I know that this is incredibly helpful for our listeners who uh, may be experiencing something similar or flirting with the idea of stopping, or maybe they have stopped and they're trying to stop. Uh, it seems certainly my impression of you is that uh, life appears considerably better for you than, than what you've what you described it was almost 10 years ago. Yes, sir. It absolutely has. I like to think of, you know, health and fitness as a four legged chair, emotional, mental, spiritual, physical. And when I am clear headed, I am, and my body's optimizing, I am able to attack all four legs of this chair in so much more of an effective and efficient manner. And so if you are thinking of stopping or you've stopped and you're thinking about going back, like it, it honestly, for me, it's just kept getting better and better. Of course, life happens. But going back to that compounded interest, you know, most people I know that have had years away from drinking or doing drugs and that decide to go back, never go, I'm so glad I went back. I forgot what I was missing. It was amazing. Mm. Most mm. people go, man, that was hell. What was I thinking? Mm. Like, I felt so much better sober. I've yet to meet someone that's like, it's way better. Like, especially if you get years away from it. Most people I know that go back are not always happy or pleased that they're back or went back. So. Yeah. Check out uh, Brad's Instagram. He's at the sober body builder on Instagram. Uh, you can also check out his uh, company key nutrition, which is uh, at key nutrition also on Instagram, anywhere else where our listener can connect with you, Brad. Um, yeah, just my podcast platform that you were on, I think like, yeah, probably in the first 30 episodes, we're on 360 now or something, but that's the key nutrition podcast. So yeah, yeah you were on there uh, a long time ago. Uh, like I think in our first 30 episodes. So you were actually the one I was the most nervous for. I was like, Oh, I followed this guy for a long time. And I was like nervous going into it. And I remember my co host at the time was like, dude, just chill. You're going to be good. <laughs> and it ended up being a really good episode. We talked about being alcohol free as well as uh, blue light blocking. So, yeah. Yeah. You've been a supporter of the blue light blocking glasses as well that I have with my sleep company, Swanic Sleep. Yeah. Thank you for that. And love uh, them. Yeah. All right, Brad. Well, thanks again. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. And uh, to our listener, thank you for listening. And we'll, we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you guys.